At the time this took place, I was 16 years old. I'm 25 now. I'll do my best to get the whole story down for you guys. It was Halloween in my small South Louisiana town. It was a crisp night. The temperature was in the mid-80s, and the heat showed no signs of slacking off. I was walking around with my older sister and our friend Brooke. My sister had gone as a cat, and Brooke as a witch. I had made the awful decision of wearing a formal gown, since I decided I was going to go as a zombie prom queen. I had a crown and everything. I was drowning in that dress, though. It was so hot, and the corset back was restricting my breathing. It was about 8.40. All the kids were pretty much cleared out of the street. We were making our way to the park next to City Hall, where my mother was supposed to pick us up. We were supposed to be there at 9. All three of us were about six blocks away at this point. My sister had stopped to talk to a friend of hers. I was not stopping, though. It was close to time for my mom to pick us up, and I was not going to be late. I was also miserable in that stupid dress, and I just wanted to go home. I carried on for about two blocks down before I noticed that my sister and my friend had stayed behind. I was annoyed to say the least, but only had four blocks to go before I could lay down in my mother's minivan. Being alone in that dark started to give me the creeps. The yellow street lights didn't do the ambience any favors. I kept my pace and kept walking, until I heard the rumble of a muffler coming up behind me. I moved all the way off the road. The large black truck came past very quickly and then turned left in front of me. I passed the intersection. I only had three blocks left. Then I heard the truck again. I would never moved back onto the road, so I didn't bother looking back this time. It wasn't too strange that the same truck had passed again. The third time they passed, as they slowed down for a good 30 seconds or so, that is what scared me. I didn't recognize the truck, and the windows were tinted heavily. As soon as I thought I could see a bit of a face, they peeled out and disappeared around a corner. I made another block before I heard that truck again. I was two blocks away from my ride now, and I was scared and starting to run. I already couldn't breathe because of that dress, and I was terrified I would pass out. As soon as I heard that truck, my stomach retched. I still kept walking, only a good bit faster than I had been. I kept my eyes down and watched my shadow. The headlights came closer. When I heard the brakes, I made the decision to run. But I was too late. I now realized how close they were to me. I felt a sharp pain in the back of my head. I looked up to see the arm sticking out of the window. An eagle clutching a sword was tattooed on his upper forearm. He had my hair wrapped around his fist. But before I could really comprehend the situation, he pumped the gas, was dragging me along the side of his truck. I was running as best as I could, clawing at his arm. I was crying and screaming. The only thing that kept running through my mind was that if I tripped, I was going to be run over. This man was laughing, and I was completely helpless. As soon as it started, he let me go. I fell to my knees on my asphalt, tore my dress, skimmed my palms, and my scalp was on fire. I was inconsolable. I was hyperventilating. I stood up and wiped my face. Then I looked around. I felt absolutely violated. I looked back the way I'd just come from, I realized that this man had dragged me by my hair for a whole block and a half. Once I caught my head, I ran across the street to the park. My mother was nowhere to be seen. I climbed into the enclosed slide and just curled up and cried. I don't know how long I was laying there before I heard my mother calling my name. I came out and she was walking up the street calling for me. I walked over to her. She looked me up and down and started freaking out. Apparently, I had blood on my face and dress from my hands. She ran to me and asking me what had happened. She kept looking me up and down for a gash or something or maybe something worse. I couldn't find my voice. I just held on to her and cried. We spent the next few hours at the police station, filling out a report. Long story short, nothing really ever came of it. My sister got into trouble with my parents for not being at the city hall on time. She was grounded. My mother had actually left city hall to go and look for us. She found my sister where I left her, and my sister hadn't even realized that I hadn't stayed. I got into trouble for not staying with my sister, but I didn't get grounded. Still pretty mad that that dress got ruined, and I lost the crown, and I'm even angrier that that man was never caught. 
This Halloween, I will be out with my godchild trick-or-treating. It'll be the first one I've gone out for in nine years since that event happened. So first off, I should say, I've been a lurker here for a while, and only got an account a little while ago so I could keep up with the stories if they got my attention. Never did I think I would have something to post here. Honestly, I wish I didn't. I would have been perfectly content to just be a lurker. Let's start off with some background on me. I'm working one of those haunted mazes for the month of October. It pays minimum wage, so I get a little spending money to get me through college. Our maze is a corn maze slash haunted house. I'm not one of those people who you get to jump out with a bloody mask and scare the visitors. I'm the girl who works the picture counter. You see, the maze I work at takes pictures of you when you go through a certain part of it. And then at the end of the maze, you can see the picture of you and your friends looking ridiculous and scared and then buy it for five bucks. It's actually pretty fun to see people's faces. There are some actual pretty hilarious ones. I've been working here for a few weeks, just a couple of nights a week. A lot of people have come through, hundreds. Every single one of them has been caught screaming, jumping, staring in horror, etc. at the point where the picture is taken. But this Friday night that changed. At about 8.30 PM, a picture loaded onto my computer and I set it to print. I was told through text that it was a party of one, so I should just print only one copy. I got ready to do so and glanced at the picture. It was a single man, completely dressed in black, a head adorned with a jet black bowler hat. He wasn't screaming, wasn't cringing away. He was looking right at the camera, his face shrouded in shadow. It unnerved me. I've never seen someone not react, never. Whatever, maybe he was just used to it. Maybe someone told him what to expect. I got over it all. Finished my night selling people their funny memories. Just as we were shutting down around 11 p.m., I was packing up the unsold pictures when I saw that man's picture again. I realized I'd never seen him to ask if he wanted to buy it. That was odd, as they had to pass my kiosk to get out of the maze. Again, I decided to not let it worry me and just drove home. Here's where it gets scary and weird. I went back to work yesterday, on Saturday, and did my job until around 8.30, and then the picture came through, party of one, man completely in black, not scared, staring at the camera. But this time, I could sort of see his face. He was smiling, in the most frightening way possible, practically all his teeth were now showing. I felt sick to my stomach and wanted to leave, but I couldn't obviously. Saturdays are our busiest nights. Finally, the end of the night rolled around. He never came to get his photo. Again. I told my boss to come check it out this time. Showed him both photos and told him how the guy never showed up to see me. I was visibly shaken, but he told me not to worry about it. It was probably some practical joker who was trying to freak us all out or something. But I am worried. What should I do? I work again tonight, so I'll update you tomorrow, but I'm freaked out. What if he comes back? What if he knows I'm working at this kiosk and knows I see his pictures? Update. So I'm convinced the man or whatever he is knows who I am and knows that I'm here. I think he's purposely here for me. Last night on Sunday, I asked my boss if I could have someone work with me because of how nervous I was. He denied my request because he didn't have an extra people working, which I guess I get. Sundays aren't that busy though even this early before Halloween. But this one was actually turning out to be, so he didn't prepare me for needing a bodyguard. He said he would come over every hour or so to check up on me if I wanted him to. I felt kind of childish and stupid, but whatever, I'll take it. It was early in the night, so it was still light out. Everything felt fine and was going okay. I was almost lured into a false sense of security, I suppose. I told him again it was fine and I would just keep in contact with him in case things got weird. Well, they did get weird. At around 7.45 or so, I realized I had to pee. I texted my boss and asked if he would send somebody over to cover for me. 
He didn't reply, which is really odd. He's normally texting me back super fast in order to maintain if something's going awry. When he finally replied to me, it was 821. I know because I was glancing at my phone every 30 seconds. He said he would send the girl working the ticket counter, which I'm going to call her Alex even though that's not her real name, to switch with me for a bit because he would work the tickets. As soon as she got to the photo kiosk, I practically ran to the bathroom because I had to pee really bad. There was a line, of course. I stood there waiting impatiently. Just as I was about to go in, movement to the left of my eye caught my attention. I look over. There's just some empty cornfield that isn't really part of the maze. It stretches on and on for miles. I saw him. I freaking saw that guy standing there, in the corn. That same sinister smile on his face. I looked around and noticed there was no line. No people were now around me. My blood ran cold and my heart was beating faster than it's ever has. I jumped into the porta potty, locked myself in, and threw up. I cried like a little baby, shaking and heaving. I literally stayed in there for almost 15 minutes. As I walked back, I kept my eyes straight ahead, ignoring the cornfields beside me. As soon as I got back to the photo kiosk, Alex noticed I was messed up and texted our boss. He said he couldn't leave the ticket counter, so he told Alex to just stay with me until I was okay. I have this irrational fear of letting people down, so stupidly, I reassured her that I was fine and that she should get back to working tickets. I'll be fine. It's stupid, I know, but it's just a thing I have. I hate letting people down, so much so that I was willing to be terrified alone at that damn kiosk for another two hours. Dumb, I know. So Alex left, rather reluctantly I think, and I was alone again. By this time it was almost 9pm. I decided to look at the pictures from around 8.30 to see if he'd gone through. He hadn't. I think he knew I wasn't at the kiosk and that's why he was in the corn by the bathrooms and not in the maze. I don't understand what I possibly did to make him come after me. Maybe he's not evil, maybe he just has a message for me or something, I don't know. I know I should just quit this job, but I can't stomach the thought of leaving them all with no one. It's hard to get someone to train them and everything else this close to Halloween because of how busy it is. I also just don't want to leave because I have this feeling in the pit of my stomach. Almost a primal feeling that no matter where I go, he's going to try and follow me. The hustle and bustle of a popular amusement park in Long Beach, California grinds to a halt when a gruesome discovery was uncovered in one of its most popular attractions, the Fun House. The cast and crew of the television show The Six Million Dollar Man was shooting an episode in the Fun House when one of its crew members accidentally knocked into a mannequin from its nesting roost, his arm falling off in the process. As the crew examined the arm that had fallen down, they were shocked to discover that inside the man was an actual human bone. And these were the mummified remains of an unknown man. Thanks in part to forensic evidence, the mannequin has been identified as an unsuccessful train robber named Elmer McCurdy. Elmer was born to a single mother in Maine back in 1880 and never knew who his father was. During his adolescence, he was known as being the town drunkard and quite the wild child. When he was 20 years old, his mother unexpectedly passed away and decided it was time for him to make his way out west in search of riches and a job. In 1907, he was recruited for the army during World War I, where he learned about explosives and the main ingredient in said explosives, nitroglycerine. After the war ended, Elmer fell into hard times, and that meant he needed to find a way to make cash and make it fast, thus starting his downward spiral into the seedy underbelly of committing crimes. During this time, he started traveling from town to town, robbing trains and banks along the way. With the knowledge of the power of nitroglycerine in his wake, he knew he could use this corrosive material to break into safes a lot easier, grab the money, and take off to his next stop. However, there was one problem that kept popping up wherever he tried to use this tactic. It never really worked out in his favor. This theory proved to be correct when Elmer attempted to rob a train in 1911 in Oklahoma. He attached the explosives to the safe, 
It ended up melting the silver inside the safe and rendering it completely useless. Another similar instance of a failed robbery attempt was in Kansas, when his position was given away while breaking into the outer layer of a bank safe, alerting the authorities across town. Finally, in October of 1911, Elmer thought he would make his big break robbing trains. He and several accomplices planned to rob a train in Oklahoma that was carrying payments that belonged to the Osage National Tribe. With their plan in motion, they thought this would be the biggest success yet. However, their assumptions were once again proven wrong, and they caught up to the train in question. Except this wasn't a cargo train they were robbing. It turned out to be a passenger train. At the end of the robbery, the crooks only ran off with $46 and two jugs of corn whiskey. Absolutely discouraged and tired of being a failure that he knew he was, he took a bottle of the corn whiskey and took refuge in a barn between Oklahoma and Kansas to drink his sorrows away. Little did he know that the police were hot on his trail and eventually caught up to Elmer and were ready to put up a fight. After the gunfire blazed across the barn, Elmer met his demise and was pronounced dead on October 7th, 1911. Elmer's corpse was taken to a funeral home in Pawhuska, Oklahoma and was embalmed while awaiting for his body to be claimed. Unfortunately, this day would never come until the funeral director decided that he was going to make a little money off of this poor soul's remains. Propped up in the funeral home, Elmer's body was used as a morbid attraction and somewhat of a physical form of advertising for the funeral home's care packages. Five years passed and Elmer's corpse was still being used, once again as a popular attraction when a couple of carnival owners wanted to take him off the funeral home's hands. The funeral director refused at first until the carnival owner convinced him that they were distant relatives of the departed Elmer and wanted to bring him home for a proper burial. The funeral director agreed as the carnival owners whisked Elmer away and would become one of the most popular attractions their carnival had ever seen, simply known as the bandit who wouldn't give up. For over 65 years, poor Elmer's body had been passed around from carnival to carnival for years and years, and no one knew that Elmer wasn't a dummy in a pinewood box, but an actual human corpse, posed as a trinket for morbid curiosity. Finally, Elmer ended up in Long Beach, California, at the New Pike Amusement Park, and strung up in the funhouse until that fateful day when the aforementioned television crew stumbled upon a gruesome discovery. Elmer McCurdy got to travel one final time to his resting place at Summit View Cemetery in Guthrie, Oklahoma, where he can rest peacefully once and for all. This story takes place the night before Halloween, October 30th. I don't remember my exact age, but I'm sure I was in middle school, either 6th or 7th grade, so I couldn't have been older than 12. To provide some detail to this story, I didn't weigh more than 100 pounds until I reached high school. I was always very skinny, flat from just about every angle, and wasn't particularly tall or short for a girl. I was overall pretty low energy. But the one holiday that always had my excitement through the roof was Halloween. I was, and still am, a huge into costumes. That night, my mother drove my sister and I to this mini strip mall where a discount clothing store had just opened maybe three months prior. The reason I call it a mini strip mall is because the only other open business on the strip was a Sally's Beauty Store and a Marshall's. It was a last minute trip it was going on 8.30, 9pm or later, so the Sally's was closed, and both the Marshalls and the clothing store we were going to was going to close within the hour. That being said, the store was surprisingly massive once you got inside, and for Halloween, they decorated the place from wall to wall with really cool decorations and costumes. It was very easy to get separated from your group in a place this big. It had many tall rows that were nearly impossible to see over. Shortly after my family and I enter the store, one of the workers in the dressing room section puts on a skeleton mask and jumps out from behind one of the racks, scaring the shit out of me and me only. My mom and sister, of course, have a great laugh, and then separated from me to go shopping on their own. I knew it was in good humor, so I went looking for a costume of my own. 
I had a serious addiction to my MP3 player at this time and had my headphones in while browsing. But I kept getting this chill on the back of my neck because I felt like I was being watched or followed. At some point, I took one of my earbuds out, turned the volume down, and noticed whenever I got that feeling, the person watching me was coming closer. I'd hear the creepiest whistling noise. There were a few other families in the store shopping, so I just told myself I was being paranoid and went to find my family. They told me they're going to go a few doors down to Marshall's and shop there before they close, and that I was welcome to keep searching the store and then come find them when I was done. My mom gave me like 20 bucks, and she and my sister left while I continued shopping. That feeling that I was still being watched or followed never left, and I eventually looked under the clothing racks as I walked. I saw a dirty pair of black sneakers on the other side of me. However, I never saw this person's face. At this point, I knew I wasn't going to find a costume there. I was starting to leave the store to walk to Marshall's and find my family. I distinctly remember hearing footsteps not far behind me at all as I was leaving, even weaving between different aisles like I was. My heart starts beating fast at this point because now I know I'm not imagining it anymore. I ran track in middle school, so I was able to pick up my pace pretty smoothly without losing my breath. The footsteps behind me did not falter. It wasn't until I was out of the store that I finally turned around and looked at who was following me. I remember freezing when I saw him. It was a white male, probably no more than 35, dressed in all black with his hoodie up, just staring at me. He didn't have any bags, so he clearly wasn't shopping. While I'm staring at him, making eye contact, he never stopped following me. In fact, it looked as if he was smirking. Looking back on this, I want to hit myself for not screaming for help then and there, but the sheer terror just locked up my vocal cords. I immediately turned around and broke out into a sprint. The Marshalls was several doors down and a good distance from the original clothing store, but I'm not slowing down at all, because I can hear that guy running behind me, and how hard he's breathing to keep up with me. He was determined. I remember making literally whimper sounds when I realized he was gaining on me a lot faster than I was expecting. I was terrified that he'd snatch me up in this dark, mostly empty strip mall, and that I'd never be able to reach my family in time. No one would question it, probably write it off as a Halloween prank they'd seen. A last minute burst of strength got me through the marshal's automatic door, but to my horror, the guy ran in after me. We were both still going full speed. My brain hasn't stopped to think of anything beyond running at this point, to actually scream or notify any other people in the store that they're witnessing this was not a prank. I was in serious danger. Luckily, as tiny as I was, and quick on my feet, because I jumped between two revolving stands with phone cases and headphones that I knew he wouldn't be able to jump through because of his size. He literally shoves one of his arms through the gap and lunges at me, trying to grab the back of my shirt. Lucky for me, he makes a lot of noise doing so, and more people in the store start to look over. I haven't stopped running at this point. I have no plans to, and by the time I find my mom, I'm babbling, sweating, and crying. And the last thing I see of the man is him taking a quick retreat from the store. To this day, my mom and sister still think I over-exaggerated this whole story. They both still firmly think it was a prank played by the man working at the store with that skeleton mask. And I hate that it even happened, because... It really discredited my story and scared them. The man working at the store with the skeleton mask was a teenage boy with a bright red uniform on. The man that stalked and almost successfully kidnapped me was a grown man who had the most terrifying atmosphere I'd ever been around. There's many things I wish I'd done differently, but to this day I thank my lucky stars that I was small and quick enough to evade him. I didn't have my cell phone that day either because I'd gotten in some kind of trouble, so if I had been taken, there would be virtually no way to find me. Just writing this gives me chills, and still to this day, I'm extremely protective around my young girl cousins, especially out in public. This happened when I was in high school. At the time, I worked part-time at a grocery store. 
and it had become a tradition for all of us to go on some sort of haunt for Halloween. The first year we went to a haunted forest, then a haunted corn maze that began with me falling face first into a mud puddle. Then included things like getting stuck in a shed type building with a slew of Jason Voorhees characters, being chased by Leatherface, and other such things. It was fun. If I find the right subreddit, I might tell those stories some other time. Anyway, I want to say this was our third year doing this. We're headed to a haunted factory in a nearby city. This was before smartphones, so we relied heavily on printed directions. Because of the size of our group, we had to travel in three cars. And I was in the last car of the caravan with my co-workers Noel and Janie. Alas, we got lost because of the people, the head of the group, were terrible at navigation. We ended up in a rougher part of the city. At one point we drove by a parking garage and I heard someone scream. Eventually our car got separated from the rest of the group at a stoplight. By the time it turned green again, we'd lost everyone. We drove around for a while, talking to one another on the phone trying to find one another. I was in the back seat talking to someone in the first car, Laura, and trying to direct my driver, Noel, while Laura tried to do the same with her husband, who was driving their car. It was not going well. Eventually, I was like, Noel, just pull over somewhere and let them come find us. Now, there were a lot of places Noel could have pulled over, like a Burger King or an office building parking lot, but he chose the parking lot of a shady bar, why, I have no idea. Perhaps it was because there was a large key bank sign nearby that served as a good landmark for the others to find. So we're waiting in this lot for the others when a line about seven cars pulled into the bar. This wasn't so surprising because it was a Friday night and they didn't park normally. They surrounded us, the front end of their cars pointing towards us. And because of their closeness, there was no space for us to drive out of there. We were trapped. For a few minutes, they just stared at us from their cars. And then they all started to get out and walk towards us in this one big mass. There were at least 10 of these rough looking guys. And by this point, I was convinced we were about to be robbed. Your wallet out, I told Noel and Janie, as I did the same. I didn't really have much money to be honest, which worried me because I wondered what they would do if it wasn't enough. I was terrified, but was trying to keep us calm and Noel seemed genuinely not really worried. I can't believe he wasn't at least somewhat concerned, especially given his car contained both a teenager and his girlfriend. As for Janie, she was so scared that she started crying. The guy who I presumed to be the leader reached for the door first, approaching the passenger side where Janie and I were. He looked inside the car at us for one moment, and then he and his group all went back to their cars and parked normally. Well, I wasn't taking any chances and ordered very sternly, Noel, go to Burger King for God's sakes. We eventually grouped up with everyone else and made it to the factory, which was far less scarier than what we just endured. Maybe it doesn't sound scary, but it really, really was. I have a few theories. One, the guys got to the car and saw that we probably didn't have much to offer them and changed their minds about mugging us. However, this one seems unlikely. Two, they thought we were someone else until they reached the car and looked inside. Definitely a lot more plausible. And three, they were just messing with us. Whatever the reason, I was truly scared, and to this day, 13 years later, I regard the city with caution. One Halloween evening, my nine-year-old little brother and 12-year-old little sister wanted to go out trick-or-treating. My mom told 15-year-old me to go with them to keep them safe. I didn't mind doing this because I knew I would get all the candy that my picky little siblings didn't want. They put on their costumes and looked for grocery bags to carry their treats with while I put on a jacket, which carried my iPod and a pocket knife. The three of us headed out and started going door to door. I had a normal routine, check if the house's porch light was on, walk up, stand behind my siblings while they rang the doorbell, wait for the person inside to give them candy, thank the person and repeat with the next house. Nothing unusual until my sister complained about being cold. 
and I decided to bring them both home. They grabbed one of my hands to keep their own warm, and I held on to them, keeping both of them close to me as we walked. We hadn't gone far at all. Our house was within eyesight, down a straight road. No one else was on the same street as us. A half a minute into the walk back, my little brother spotted a house to our right, six down from our own house, whose porch light was on, though it hadn't been on earlier. We all walked up, but there was no doorbell, so I opened up the storm door and knocked on the inner wooden door. We waited for a few seconds and heard nothing, so I knocked again, waited, still no answer. At this point, I got a weird feeling and figured we should just continue walking home, much to my little brother's disappointment. We had just gotten back onto the street and were headed off again when we heard the door of the house swing open and a man loudly called out, Hey! I turned around while grabbing my sibling's hand and in the open doorway was a tall man. I couldn't see his face or what he was really wearing because it was dark outside and the light was spilling out from behind him. But judging from his voice, he sounded middle-aged. The inner wooden door was wide open and the man was propping open the storm door with his right arm while he leaned against the door frame. Behind him, I could see a set of carpeted stairs and what looked like a kitchen with a ceiling light that illuminated it all. I can't repeat the exact conversation the man and I had, but I remember the gist of it. He shouted, I have candy inside. With a distinct inflection and tone that set even more alarms off in my head, it was as if you could hear he had a huge smile without actually seeing it. I didn't see any candy at all behind him. I had enough common sense and stranger danger talks from when I was young to know I should never go inside a stranger's house on Halloween. I gripped my silent sibling's hands tight and replied no thanks and began to speed walk away dragging them with me. As we were walking away he called out again, well are you sure? Which almost sounded pleading. Not stopping, I looked over again and replied yes to which he said, oh. Okay. In a creepy, exaggerated, sad way. He turned inside and closed the door. Who was this weird-ass adult man trying to get kids to come inside his house? And intentionally sounding hurt if they refused. It gave me all kinds of bad vibes, and while we hurried home, I told my siblings they should never go inside a stranger's house on Halloween. We got home quickly while my mom and I were checking all the candy for signs of tampering told her about the man. She seemed weirded out, but we really didn't end up doing anything about it. Do not try to get kids to come inside your house on Halloween, whether intentions are innocent or not. There's an old nursery rhyme that goes a little something like this. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Although there are several historical inaccuracies involved with the nursery rhyme, one thing is for certain. Lizzie Borden will forever be blamed for the deaths of her father and stepmother on Thursday, August 4th, 1892. And her home is said to be one of the most cherished ghost tours and haunted attractions in the United States to this very day. But to further understand the circumstances that were involved in her trial, we must take a step back in time to learn more about the axe murderess of Fall River. Lizzie Andrew Borden was born on July 19, 1860 to Andrew and Sarah Borden. Her father Andrew was known throughout Fall River as one of the most successful businessmen in town and was quoted to be worth 300000 back in 1892. In today's currency, he would be well worth over 9630000 his business and property development, being the president of the bank, as well as his own textile mills. Andrew Borden was a man who was often frugal about his spendings, especially when it came to his wife and daughters, Lizzie and Emma. The family was known to be very religious, as the girls had become more involved in their church's activities and functions. Lizzie was a popular Sunday school teacher and served within various church-related organizations including the Christian Endeavor School and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. When the girl's mother passed away, Mr. Borden remarried a prominent woman from the community named Abby Dufree Gray. It was no secret among members of the Borden family 
that Lizzie absolutely despised her new stepmother, even going as far as to only refer to her as Mrs. Borden. Their animosity towards each other, the main meals were regularly eaten as a family, reported by the housekeeper of 25-year-old Bridget Sullivan. Great tension was building throughout the home, and in several reported incidents, could have been the main cause for the murders of Andrew and Abby to occur. For example, Lizzie and Emma would often go on lavish vacations at the expense of their father, and he absolutely disproved of. However, he would reciprocate similar actions in which he would spoil and treat Abby's family to various gifts of real estate that Mr. Borden had procured. This turned out to be one of the biggest rifts between the Borden sisters and Mr. Borden, as the dark energy inside this house came to a head. Looming over the house, there was an isolated incident that occurred that Abby Borden believed that her family's lives were in immediate danger. The family had had an awful bout of food poisoning from mutton that had been left on the stove for several days as the family's main protein for the week. But to Abby, she knew her husband had made enemies with people throughout Fall River and thought that this was retaliation for his actions. This was the main theory until an unexpected visitor came to call the Borden estate. A day before Andrew and Abby would be found dead, Sarah Borden's brother John Morse arrived for a visit to discuss new business ventures with Andrew. Reportedly, their discussion turned into a full aggressive argument and they say the rest of the conversation is history. On the fateful day of August 4th, 1982, one final discussion was exchanged between Andrew and John at around 8.48 a.m. John left the estate with a pair of oxen and was said to be back around noon for the main meal. However, this meal would never come. Between the hours of 9 and 10.30 a.m., Abby retreated upstairs to make the bed in the guest room, although it was rumored to be a chore that was shared between Lizzie and Emma. This was when footsteps could be heard from the staircase and stop in the guest room behind Abby. This was when the bludgeoning frenzy began. Abby was said to have turned around to face her attacker when she was struck on the side of the head with a hatchet, slicing her above the ear and on the side of her head as she turned and fell face down onto the hardwood floor. As the rhyme states, Abby was struck 17 times continuously to the back of her head as she let out her last breath. Unbeknownst to Andrew, his wife was upstairs dead as he returned back to the estate around 10.30 to be let in by the housekeeper Bridget. According to legend, his key wouldn't allow him to open up the front door and had to knock several times before being let in. Bridget recalls later that day that she could hear Miss Lizzie's laughter coming from the top of the stairs but couldn't see her. When Andrew asked where Abby had been to Lizzie, He'd recalled that she'd seen Mrs. Borden since breakfast and assumed she was looking after a friend who was ill at the time of Abby's murder. Soon after, Andrew retired to the sitting room where he took off his boots and put on a pair of sleeping slippers and proceeded to take what was intended to be a short nap before returning back to work. What happened next is the second half of that creepy nursery rhyme. During his slumber, Andrew was attacked with that same hatchet that had just killed his second wife. With fatal blows to his head, calculating to be struck between 10 and 11 times. In one of the most gruesome crime scene photos taken at the scene of the murder, Andrew's head was completely caved in from the hatchet wounds. One of his eyes sliced perfectly in half as it dangled from his still bleeding head. At the time of the murder, Bridget had been cleaning windows upstairs when she heard Lizzie's loud and frantic voice from downstairs yelling that her father was dead and someone came in and killed him. The family physician Dr. Bowen, who happened to be the Borden's neighbor across the street, came forthwith and pronounced that both Andrew and Abby were deceased. Borden's time of death was reported to be 11 a.m. on that day. Soon the investigation of the Borden murders were underway as Lizzie, Emma, and Bridget were questioned thoroughly by the police. Lizzie's responses to the investigators' questions proved to be extraordinarily contradicting and somewhat inappropriate for the time as her behavior soon became questionable in itself. One contradicting statement used in the trial was that before the murders took place, Lizzie stated that she heard a scraping sound as well as a possible groan before she'd returned inside the house, only to later retract that statement 
claiming that she didn't hear anything at all and didn't know that Abby had been murdered. When Lizzie stated that she hadn't seen Abby when she was killed, Bridget and a next door neighbor proved that this other contradicting statement as they proceeded halfway up the staircase and could visibly see Abby's dead body in the guest room laying face down. The police also noticed that Lizzie's behavior was super bizarre for someone who had just lost both her parents in a very brutal manner. Her demeanor was calm, cool, and collected. As police conducted a forensic sweep through the home, they found the murder weapon or weapons in the basement, including a hatchet with a broken wooden handle. During early forensic analysis for the late 1800s and early 1900s, Andrew and Abby's stomachs were examined to see if the theory of poisoning had been a contributing factor to their deaths, but results proved to be negative. In the weeks leading up to the murder, Lizzie had been seen purchasing acid for preserving her expensive furs, but that was also not found in the Borden's autopsy reports. Police also did not do a thorough inspection of Lizzie's room during the investigation, as she indicated that she'd not been feeling well, and police didn't press the issue any further. Towards the end of the trial, this once again proved to be a failed and possibly a fatal mistake in pinning Lizzie as the murderer. Later that night on August 4th, Police had been stationed outside the Borden home to protect the last surviving members of the family, and they made a very chilling discovery. He noticed Lizzie and a family friend Alice Russell go down to the cellar with a slop bucket and kerosene lamp. By this time, John Morse had returned back to the Borden estate and retired to the other guest room. The next morning, he left and was attacked by several members of the Fall River, to which police had to escort him back to his home for his own protection. Further investigations were carried out, including inspecting articles of clothing in the home and taking the suspected murder weapon out. As the evening progressed, rumors started flying about the town as the Bordens would be visited by another prominent member of the community. This time it was the mayor as well as the police, telling Lizzie that she was the main suspect in the double homicide. According to their friend Alice, when she went downstairs to the kitchen to greet Lizzie, she saw her tearing up one of her favorite dresses. Lizzie stated that she'd gotten paint on the dress and it wouldn't come out. The only way to get rid of it was to burn it. Lizzie's hearing was held on August 8, 1892. Since the inquest was deemed private by the state of Massachusetts, her request for having the family lawyer present was denied. Once again, her behavior was described as highly inappropriate during the inquest as she had to take doses of morphine to calm her nerves and proved to have aided in damning her case further. On August 11th, she was arrested and thrown into jail. Her inquest was ruled as being inadmissible in June of 1893 to prove whether or not she was guilty or innocent. The grand jury was selected on November 7th as her indictment was carried out on December 2nd. The trial was long and arduous and took place on June 5, 1893 in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Ironically, five days before Lizzie's trial was underway, there had been another axe slaying in Fall River, killing a woman by the name of Bertha Manchester in her kitchen. Although the murders were quite similar in fashion, Lizzie had not been the murderer in that case. Instead, a Portuguese immigrant named Jose Corella de Mello was arrested and convicted of the murder of Bertha Manchester in 1894. It was during Lizzie's trial that the hatchet found in the Borden house was ruled out as being the murder weapon. Prosecutors argued aggressively that the original handle could have been disposed due to it being covered in blood. The subject of Lizzie's dress being burned was also brought up at the trial, but nothing came to fruition in the eyes of the defense. During one point of the trial, the severed heads of Andrew and Abby were brought in as forensic evidence to show the jury the extensive wounds the victims had procured. At the sight, Lizzie fainted in the courtroom. After lengthy arguments being cross-examined across the courtroom, it was time for the jury to decide Lizzie's fate. On June 20th, 1893, after an hour and a half of deliberation, Lizzie Borden was acquitted of any connections to the death of her parents. Although rumors and speculations continued to taint the town of Fall River about her, she refused to believe any of it, only to ensure her innocence from the very beginning. No one 
had ever been arrested and charged with the Andrew and Abby Borden murders, and it remains an unsolved mystery to this very day. As the sisters grow older, Lizzie and Emma moved away from the family estate to another property in a wealthy district of Fall River. Lizzie passed away from pneumonia on June 1, 1927, at the age of 66. As for her sister Emma, she passed away nine days after in a nursing home in Newmarket, New Hampshire. Today, the Lizzie Borden case is heavily argued, as more theories are predicted and analyzed as her infamous reputation still lives on in a plethora of books, movies, television series, and yes, even podcast episodes. Today, the former home of the Borden family has opened as a popular bed and breakfast and haunted attraction where guests can experience the ghostly encounters that are reported throughout the home. So it's up to you. Decide Lizzie's fate in your own mind. Was she truly innocent or actually guilty? I was about seven or eight years old when this happened. It was around Halloween. My sister and I were in our living room watching scary movies. My mom had just left for work. It was about 9.30 at night, and she worked the third shift in a factory an hour or so away. My father had just got done walking her to her car and saying goodbye, watching as she backed out, as he always did, to make sure that she would be safe in her car and our neighborhood wasn't the best to live in, so... He'd come back inside, sat down on the couch, and we kept watching the TV. Child's play had just begun, and being a kid and always terrified of dolls, I remember curling up on the couch by one of our dogs. I'd noticed that she'd woken up, was staring at one of the doors in our living room that led out to the front porch. To explain it better, we had an enclosed front porch, which was more like a big mudroom. It had an L-shaped table where I would do homework or just hang out with my friends. It was the first room you'd be in after opening the two front doors. After you came in the house, you were in that room. You could either go left to our old double doors leading to the living room, or you could walk straight to go through a glass panel door leading to the kitchen. I looked over at the door that she was staring at. I saw a silhouette standing in our front porch area. How we didn't hear the front door open is beyond me. I look back now and just assume maybe my dad didn't lock the doors or... Maybe the left one got slightly opened. We had whitish curtains on those two double doors, letting us see through the front porch a little bit, as we'd also leave the light on until we go to bed, so people would know someone was home and awake. I don't remember if I pointed the man out or if my sister did. My dad got up and booked it to the front porch where this man was. Really quickly to add a little background on my dad. Six feet tall and kind of overweight. He used to be a nurse, then went into the Marine Corps. He used to be in pretty good shape and terrifying until he broke his hips and had to get surgery, resulting in him having to usually use a walker or just hobble wherever he'd go. Basically, when I say he booked it, he wasn't full on sprinting because he really couldn't do that. Nevertheless, he was still a pretty intimidating guy due to his demeanor and how he just carried himself. I remember hearing the glass door open and then just hearing a muffled yell. This went on for what I felt like forever, but in reality it was probably maybe 10 minutes or so. My sister, being 12 at the time, was just laying on the ground by the double doors, trying to hear what they were saying. I think I was just watching the movie or something along those lines. Anyway, my dad comes in back a short while later and sits down. He says to not worry about it and just keep watching the movie. He ended up turning it off earlier and having us go to bed but said that as he was going to sleep downstairs again. I was only seven or eight, so while I was smart enough to put two and two together, he was worried about that guy coming back, I could tell. I wasn't too worried about it because as a kid, your parents can handle anything. Thankfully, that guy never came back, but I found out a week later what had happened after my sister and I did some eavesdropping and prying to put the stories together. Apparently what happened was the guy came into our house and was either drunk or on drugs. They weren't sure which. He was going to come into our house all the way, but when he saw my dad, he was taken aback. My dad just kept asking him who he was. Why are you in my house? The guy just kept saying, I'm here to work, man. I need money. 
Please just let me work. My dad tried to get him to leave once, and the guy just stared at him, not saying anything, which obviously made my dad more upset. He literally had to open up the front door and push the guy out. The guy just kept repeating again. Please, I need money. Don't make me go out there. Please, let me work. I don't want to go out there. My dad must have finally got him out of the house after giving him a few choice words. I'm unsure if he called the police and notified them, but knowing my dad and seeing as no officers came, I'm assuming he figured he had it under control. Also explaining why he slept in the living room that night. We never saw that guy again, thankfully, and didn't have anyone else try anything similar. I still wonder if that guy was severely intoxicated or on drugs, but either way, I'm glad he never came back. Anyone and everyone who's been on this earth for quite some time has heard of the Japanese video game and film franchise, Silent Hill, and its real-life small American town that made it famous, known as Centralia, Pennsylvania. But what connects these two ideas together, and what turned this once populous, busy community into the toxic ghost town it is today? I hate to break it to a lot of video game enthusiasts out there, but Centralia has almost nothing to do with Silent Hill except for the fact that it is continuously emitting toxic gas into the atmosphere and creating that foggy-like ambience that everyone has come to recognize and love. For the people of Centralia, this was once a home to a flourishing mining community in northeastern Pennsylvania that had 14 highly active coal mines and a population of around 2,500 residents until the early 20th century. It was then that the town's population continued to dwindle and flatline as many still refused to leave their homes after the state became involved. A town that is forever affected by a burning inferno to this very day. Centralia has always had a very rich and lush history, beside the riches of the raw, unrefined fossil fuels that are buried underneath the town's surface. The mines themselves were often overlooked, even during the construction of the Mine Run Railroad in 1854. The original name of the town was called Bull's Head, named after their local tavern's Bullhead's Tavern in 1832. By 1842, the land was bought by the Locust Mountain Coal and Iron Company, and thus, the mining boom began. Many of the mines were anthracite coal, an abundant form of hard and black coal that has a submetallic luster and a sheen that goes by many names including black coal, blind coal, and Kilkenny coal, and also black diamond coal. It has the highest carbon content and the highest ranking of all coals known to this earth. A man named Alexander Ray, who was a mining engineer and then became the town's founder, brought his family to Bulls Run and started developing it into a village. From Bulls Run to Centerville, from Centerville to Centralia, the town was on its way to becoming a place where families could be raised. Money and jobs were creating a booming economy. But all good things must come to an end, as unfortunate tragedies started plaguing the town. One such tragedy involved the founding father himself, Alexander Ray, murdered in cold blood by members of the Molly Maguire Secret Society on October 17, 1868, while on a buggy trip from Centralia to Mount Carmel. After this incident, three men were convicted and hanged in the vicinity of Bloomsburg on March 25, 1878 as were many other members of the Molly Maguires, all throughout the state of Pennsylvania. However, this isn't the only time that Molly Maguires caused ruckus in Centralia. A local legend goes that a priest by the name of Father Daniel Ignatius McDermott put a curse on Centralia in retaliation for being attacked by several members of the Molly Maguires back in 1869. It was said that the St. Ignatius Roman Catholic Church would be the last building standing someday in Centralia an omen of what was yet to come. Up until the 1980s, several descendants of the Molly Maguires lived in Centralia, but that, of course, was open to a legend interpretation. In its heyday, Centralia reached a whopping population of approximately 2,761, complete with various churches of different Christian denominations, five hotels, 
27 saloons, two theaters, a bank, a post office, and 14 stores. The town started taking notice of its declining population as the U.S. prepared itself for World War I. Then the stock market crash of 1929 caused another big rift for its citizens, resulting in the closure of five mines from the Lehigh Valley Coal Company, laying off many, many workers and causing the town to go into a downward spiral. Even with the cutbacks, this didn't stop bootleg miners from continuing to work to make ends meet. This was when the miners implemented various mining techniques, such as pillar robbing, where the miners would take coal from the part of the mine that keeps the roof from caving in. Rumor has it that this was a contributing factor to the collapse of several of the mines, ultimately causing its town's demise as we know it today. On that fateful day, Memorial Day weekend, May 27, 1962, the Centralia mine fires began as a coal steam fire erupted underground, spreading through its various labyrinth of mine shafts and tunnels, burning over 3,700 acres of land. It's often debated what exactly caused the fires, whether they were originally controlled fires started by the fire department as a way to clean up the town's overflowing landfill that got out of hand or from a band of bootleg miner brothers who started a fire underground near the landfill that was never extinguished. The theory was that the brothers became overwhelmed by the fumes, leading to their untimely deaths as the fires continued to spread. Supposedly, the fire department lined the landfill with incombustible material to help contain the fire. But two days later, residents were alarmed to see flames coming up through the town, and then again on June 4th. As the fire smoldered, residents started complaining of horrid smells coming into their homes and businesses, making them severely ill. Now, it was up to city council on how they would handle this now overwhelming disaster. A mining inspector was brought in to evaluate the situation at hand. Upon inspection, a letter was sent to the Lehigh Valley Coal Company, stating the fire was started from an unknown origin and was getting out of control. The more the fire spread, the more lethal amounts of carbon monoxide seeped through the mines, deeming Centralia a very dangerous place to live. There were many attempts to try to extinguish the coal fires, although most were unsuccessful. One attempt was the state of Pennsylvania digging trenches to expose the trapped flames, to make them easily extinguishable. But when architects started examining the plans more extensively, an unfortunate factor was competing with Mother Nature herself. The amount of money needed to be able to extract the amount of Earth's crust that needed to be evacuated proved to be too costly, and the project quickly ran out of funding. Another plan was to use a mixture of crushed rock and water to again attempt to extinguish the fires, but ran into troubles again when below freezing temperatures caused water lines to freeze and halt the stone grinding. As luck would have it, the project ran out of funding yet again, being over 20,000. Even with all these setbacks, Centralia's citizens weren't ready to give up their home. People still lived their everyday lives, even as a good chunk of its own dwindling population moved away, looking to start over and away from the toxins rising from the earth. Every living thing started to suffer, from its residents becoming sick, passing out in their homes from vicious cycles of carbon monoxide poisoning, to its wildlife and flora dying slowly and painfully. However, it wasn't until February 14, 1981, when one of the biggest possible tragedies in Centralia brought the nation to its own back door. 12-year-old Tom Dimboski fell down into a 150-foot deep sinkhole right underneath his feet. Thankfully, he survived, but only because he was able to hold onto a tree root and was pulled out of the sinkhole by his cousin. By now, the federal government had started taking matters into its own hands. In 1983, when they came into the town armed with $42 million to purchase it, tear down the buildings, and find its remaining citizens safer places to live. But still, not everyone was on board for abandoning their homes. Out of its original population, a mere 63 residents stayed in town by 1993. And as far as the state of Pennsylvania was concerned, these 63 folks had become squatters in their own homes, as Pennsylvania had no choice but to invoke eminent domain over Centralia. Years passed by, and by 2013, fewer than 10 people remained and won a settlement against the state. 
Each was awarded a whopping sum of 349500 and could actually own their homes until the day of their death. Then the state of Pennsylvania would seize the land and tear down whatever buildings were left. At the time of this settlement, Centralia's then mayor Lamar Mervin spoke on the matter at hand and how he chose to stay with his wife instead of taking the bailout that was offered at the time. He recalled his wife looking at the people from the state and told them they couldn't have their house. It was the only home he'd ever known and owned and wanted to keep it as long as he was still alive. Upon his death in 2010, at the age of 93, it was the last remaining home on the three block long area. Today, the inferno still burns underground as experts predict that there is enough coal underneath Centralia to continue to stay lit for another 250 years. As with its citizens, around five people still call Centralia home and don't plan on moving out anytime soon. The municipal building still stands alongside the fire station's garage, as well as the churches of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary in city limits, and an Eastern Orthodox cemetery the St. Peter and Paul Church and Cemetery on the outskirts of town. To this day, Centralia is still a popular tourist destination for people who want to see the real Silent Hill for themselves. As you take a glance through the billowing fumes and fog that has become synonymous with Centralia, it's a real life ghost town, now covered with trees and other plant life, instead of homes and people, along with warning signs to deter anyone who tries to visit. However, if you aren't afraid of a few danger signs and still decide to stop, remember its history and the ever-thriving town it once was. Maybe even say a silent prayer for it. To those who believe in ghost stories and the lore that surrounds Centralia, perhaps it was the curse manifested from Father Daniel McDermott that caused Centralia to fall and meet its unfortunate demise. On October 30th of 1975, 15-year-old Martha Moxley and a group of her friends participated in what's colloquially known as Mischief Night, sometimes known as Devil's Night. The night before Halloween sees children and teenagers the world over, engaging in all kind of manner of pranks and vandalism. Martha and company chose to hurl full rolls of toilet paper over trees or houses so that long trails of paper were formed. Then. As if to alert the homeowners to their mischief, Martha and her friends would buzz the doorbell before running off into the night. It was innocent, albeit irritating fun, and as the group walked excitedly between potential targets, Martha was spotted talking to an older boy named Thomas Skackle. Later that evening, the pair were spotted swapping kisses and appeared to depart the larger group together at around 9.30pm. As she walked away hand in hand with the object of her affections, Martha's friends believed they were watching a budding romance, but the truth was, they'd never see Martha again. The next morning, Martha's mother walked out into the backyard of her home after spotting something lying underneath the tree. It looked like a pile of clothing at first, but as she got closer, Martha's mother realized what she was looking at. It wasn't some elaborate Halloween decoration, it was the bloodied, beaten body of her own daughter. Not only had Martha been mutilated to the point of almost being unrecognizable, but there were signs that she'd been carnally violated prior to her death. Pieces of a broken golf club were laying next to her body. There were signs that Martha's killer had resorted to stabbing her with the sharp end of that broken club once it snapped. After coordinating with a number of local sporting goods stores, law enforcement managed to trace the ownership of that club to none other than the Skackle family whose son was one of the last people to see Martha alive. Naturally, this made Thomas a prime suspect. His suspicion was diverted when his younger brother, Michael, made a deeply disturbing confession. Michael claimed that around midnight, he'd been window peeping from a vantage point in a tree beside Martha's home. During that time, he claimed to have heard Michael confess to killing Martha with the golf club. Another child testified that Michael was given special privileges due to his family's connections. It had once been heard to say, I'm going to get away with murder. 16 years later, the Moxley family commissioned a private investigator to reopen Martha's case. 
The investigator's written conclusion came to be known as the Sutton Report, and it revealed the fluid nature of Michael Skakel's ever-changing account, how it morphed from one that implied guilt to one that implied innocence, almost like he was being coached by the family lawyers. The report makes it clear that despite Thomas being the most obvious suspect, it was in fact Michael that was guilty of Martha's murder. It took over a decade of campaigning and investigating, but in June of 1998, Michael Skakel was finally charged with murder and his bail set at half a million dollars. On May 7th of 2002, Michael Skakel's defense attorney told the courtroom that he was an innocent man and had been in his cousin's house at the time of the murder. However, the prosecution was quick to point out that Michael had already admitted to have been hiding up a tree not far from Martha's home, that very same tree under which Martha's body was found. The prosecution then argued that Michael had been watching Martha kissing his older brother, then driven by jealousy, had approached her for similar affections once she was alone. The prosecution then purported that when she rejected him, Michael became so enraged that he attacked Martha with a golf club, beating her to death in the process. Prosecuting attorneys made such a convincing case that on June 7th of 2002, the jury pronounced Thomas Skakel guilty of first degree murder and he was subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment at the Garner Correctional Institution in Newtown, Connecticut. Following his conviction, Thomas insisted on his innocence, and in 2007, his attorneys officially filed for a new trial. Their bid was centered on the statement given by Tony Bryant, cousin to departed basketball player Kobe Bryant, and a former classmate of Skackles. Bryant stated that on the night of Martha's murder, one of his friends openly admitted to wanting to attack Martha. The claim was inconsequential, but threw just enough doubt onto Skackle's conviction that his case was brought before the Connecticut Supreme Court in December of 2016. To the Skackle's family's boundless disappointment, Michael's murder conviction was upheld by a 4-3 to three majority, with one judge adding that the conviction was the result of an overwhelming evidence presented by the prosecutors. The same judge stated that it was in his opinion that Michael's legal representation had not been incompetent, and his conviction was the result of his own guilt. Despite his initial conviction and 2016 denial of his appeal, Michael was eventually released from prison. It was announced that he would not be facing a retrial. Yet several important questions remain. Is Michael Skackle an innocent man who should have never seen the inside of a prison cell? Or... Was a murderer content to play a legal long game until he could pervert justice and secure his own freedom? Born on August 9th of 1990, Teresa Lynn Venagas lived in Dickinson, Texas with her large and loving family. Teresa was very close to her two older sisters, but she had a particularly special relationship with her grandmother, whose home was a place of sanctuary when Teresa's home life grew too hectic. She was a good student and led an active social life, so it wasn't unusual for her to return home fairly late, even on a school night, and Halloween of 2006 was no different. Teresa told her parents that she planned to attend a costume party with some high school friends but the story was merely a ruse. In reality, she planned to meet up with a 19-year-old love interest who was driving down to see her. We can assume that Teresa was excited at the prospect of meeting the young man in the flesh, as they'd been talking online for quite a while by that point. Little did she know that night was to be the last night of her entire life. A few days later, Teresa's body was found by a dirt bike rider. She was lying in a shallow grave, just a few hundred meters away from her high school. When the local homicide detectives began investigating her murder, their first port of call was to read over her cell phone records. Teresa had apparently called her date around 10 p.m. and an accompanying text message revealed that she was having trouble locating their proposed meeting place. This obviously made him the prime suspect in her murder, but a forensic examination discovered that he was innocent of the crime. Not a single trace of his DNA could be found on Teresa's body. Law enforcement managed to place her at a party on California Avenue at around 11 p.m. 
but it seems Teresa visited another party on Dickinson's Bramble Lane, where she was spotted shortly after midnight in the company of a man described as looking older than her. It's not clear who this man is, but we know for a fact that he's one of the last people to see Teresa alive, and law enforcement's failure to apprehend him is symptomatic of the case's frustrations and failures. Despite not releasing many details of the death, the police made it clear that foul play was suspected. It later emerged that she'd been beaten badly and had a closed casket funeral due to the water damage her body endured after being dumped in a drainage ditch. Others said that Teresa's body had some of the worst ligature marks they'd ever seen and that when her body was found, a belt was still tied tight around her neck. It was also discovered that Teresa's hair had been cut off, which possibly indicated some kind of personal motive or at least the killer was disturbed enough to take it as some kind of trophy. After local law enforcement appealed for an eyewitnesses, several people reported seeing a Caucasian man with long dark hair acting suspiciously near the high school on the night of Halloween. A volunteer search party also found a pair of glasses and a hair clip, not too far from the drainage ditch, both belonging to Teresa, indicating that she had been resisting her attacker before she was finally overcome. DNA belonging to the killer was recovered from Teresa's body, but almost exactly 15 years later, it's still not been used to identify a suspect. It should also be noted that more than 45 people have been interviewed in relation to the case, but not a single person has been officially charged with Teresa's murder. On November 1st of 2016, almost 10 years exactly after her murder, the Dickinson Police Department released a statement pertaining to Teresa's death. There have been significant developments during the last 10 years, the post read, but investigators are still looking for additional information to help give Teresa's family closure. The use of the word significant developments is curious indeed, but it wasn't at all clear what these developments consisted of. However, some have suggested that the case had been linked to a series of other murders that have taken place in what are ominously referred to as the Texas Killing Fields. Nine months after Teresa was murdered, the body of Bridget Guerin was discovered on Crystal Beach. Crystal Beach is only an hour and a half drive from Dickinson and is easily accessible through Galveston Island. And on top of that, the crime scene was eerily similar to Teresa's. Bridget was beaten, strangled, and indecently assaulted, then found dead half naked near a body of water. Despite there being no official law enforcement connection made between the two murders, it is plausible that the similarities in the murder mean that they were committed by the same person. Given the relatively close time frame and the geological proximity to the so-called killing fields. The Texas killing fields consist of a 50 mile stretch of interstate 45, which runs between the cities of Houston and Galveston. The place became infamous following the discovery of four corpses near the Calder oil fields, which are just six miles away from where Teresa's body was found. Since the 1970s, the disappearances of almost 30 different young women have been associated with this patch of land, a place which has also been described as a serial killer cemetery due to the area's pronounced isolation. Some theorize that multiple serial killers have operated in that area over the years, but only a handful of the murders have been officially connected. Another of these murders is that of 23-year-old Sarah Trusty who was discovered in the Texas City Dyke on June 28, 2002. Sarah was murdered four years before Teresa, but the dyke is only 16 miles away from Dickinson High School. It's entirely possible that whoever killed these girls might as well be the same person that killed Teresa. But due to the time constraints and dwindling evidence, there's only a slim chance that her killer will ever meet justice. Perhaps the man still resides in the Dickinson area, biding his time, just waiting for a chance to claim another victim. And when he does, perhaps the Texas killing fields will become the final resting place of yet another innocent young woman. Halloween morning of 1981, 
while the sun rose over the St. Francis Covenant in Amarillo, Texas. 76-year-old Sister Tadea Benz was sound asleep in her small, sparsely decorated bedroom. On an average morning, Sister Tadea would wake up at 5 a.m. sharp, and she'd walk down to the on-site chapel to attend morning prayers. But on the morning of October 31st, one of Tadea's closest confidants noticed her absence with concern. I was concerned because she seldom missed chapel, Sister Angela Martinix later said. So following the conclusion of morning prayers, a handful of nuns walked over to Tadea's bedroom in order to check up on her. When they arrived, they found that the door to her room was closed. This was extremely unusual. Sister Tadea was hard of hearing and usually kept her door ajar to hear the morning buzzer. Upon opening up her door, her fellow nuns were completely unprepared for what they found. Sister Tadea was lying naked on the cold stone floor, arms outstretched by her sides with a pool of blood surrounding her uncovered head. One of the nuns hurried to render first aid, but it was too late. Sister Tadea was dead. At first glance, it appeared that Sister Tadea's fatal head trauma was the result of an accidental fall, and to preserve her dignity, her fellow nuns wrapped her naked body in a bedsheet and placed it back on her bed as word of the sudden passing rippled through the covenant. A devastating young nun named Sister Florentine stopped by Tadea's bedroom in order to pay her last respects. But while sitting near the body, Florentine spotted something that sent a chill up her spine. One of her bedroom windows was ajar and the pane of glass it contained was broken. Sister Florentine realized that someone had broken into Tadea's room and if that was the case, her death might not have been an accident as they initially suspected. After receiving word of a 911 call from the Covenant, two responding police officers performed a preliminary examination of Sister Tadea's body, and it was then that the first signs of homicide were discovered. She had severe bruising around her neck, and coupled with the lack of evidence of a break-in, this led the officers to surmise that she had indeed been murdered. Yet following an examination at the local coroner's office, Local law enforcement learned that not only had Sister Tadea been beaten and strangled by some unknown assailant, she had been sexually assaulted too. After analyzing a series of fingerprints taken from her bedroom, law enforcement discovered they belonged to a 17-year-old named Johnny Frank Garrett. At his murder trial, Garrett denied all charges despite the overwhelming evidence against him. Pubic hairs had been taken from the crime scene and determined to be exact match for Garrett's. A steak knife found under today's bed was found to match the set of knives that Garrett had in his own home kitchen. Garrett admitted to sneaking into the Covenant on the night of the murder, but he said his intention was merely to rob the place. He had entered the Covenant not through today's bedroom, but by the front door, and that his route took him from the medication room to the cafeteria, which is where he claimed to have picked up the knife. Garrett then claimed to have crept into several of the nuns' bedrooms, including today's, and explained the presence of his fingerprints by claiming he'd leaned on a headboard while trying to reach a valuable looking crucifix which was mounted on the wall. Following its retrieval, Garrett claimed he promptly fled the covenant and was back at his parents' house by 10 p.m. However, one of the nuns stated that he couldn't have entered the covenant through its front door since it was only unlocked for scheduled visitors. Another nun was said to refute Garrett's claim as well and that he stole some kind of expensive looking crucifix as Tadea had taken a vow of poverty and eschewed from luxurious material possessions. During Garrett's trial, the prosecuting attorney called a psychologist to the stand, one who'd interviewed Garrett while he was on remand. This psychologist was of the opinion that Garrett was severely mentally impaired, describing him as chronically psychotic. He also added that he had one of the most violent histories of abuse and neglect I've ever encountered in 28 years of practice. The court heard that when Garrett was just a boy, he'd been the victim of some kind of horrific molestations at the hand of his stepfather. This same stepfather then loaned Garrett out to other child abusers for the right price, all while giving the boy with drugs and alcohol in order to keep him quiet. While extremely tragic, Garrett's past was used to paint him as a violent and unstable young man, and coupled with a mountain of physical evidence, the jury sought fit to convict him of first-degree murder, 
He was sentenced to death in September of 1982. Garrett spent the next 10 years on death row until finally, the date of his execution was set for January 6th of 1992. Yet just days before he was due to face the lethal injection, there's an attempt at intervention from the most unlikeliest of places. The head of the Catholic Church, Pope John Paul II himself, contacted the Texas Board of Appeals with an appeal for clemency. Not only did he strongly object to the death penalty, but the Pope also argued that there was a considerable amount of new information coming to light, some of which indicated that Garrett was innocent of the crime he was accused of. The governor of Texas eventually relented and held a meeting to decide on whether or not Garrett's death sentence should be overturned. 17 board members held a simple vote, but not a single one of them wished to commute Garrett's sentence. And as a result, Johnny Frank Garrett was executed on February 11th of 1992 at just age 28. The violation and murder of a nun is perhaps one of the most viscerally disturbing crimes imaginable. It is understandable that the police would want to close that case quickly to avoid a morale panic. But in their haste to do so, could they have condemned an innocent young man to death? Twelve years following his death, Amarillo-based attorney Jesse Quackenbush took it upon himself to prove Garrett's innocent. Quackenbush told one media outlet that the newly discovered evidence of Johnny Frank Garrett's innocence is so compelling it will cause even the most bloodthirsty proponents of the death penalty to shake their heads with doubt. He followed up with a letter to the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles, informing them that there were numerous similarities between Sister Today's slang and that of 77-year-old Narni Box Bryson, who was just killed three months before Sister Today in the exact same part of town. The man convicted of Bryson's murder, Leoncio Perez Ruida, was incarcerated at the time of Quackenbush's investigation. But due to a lack of resources, law enforcement was unable to formally reopen the case. But even if the killer really did turn out to be Leoncio, a few years were tacked onto his already lengthy sentence. The finality of the death sentence means wrongly convicted innocents will never get the redemptive justice they deserve. With an elderly Leoncio approaching his own earthly exit, it's fast becoming too late to talk to anyone who actually knows how Sister Tadea Benz lost her life. Perhaps we'll never truly know the identity of her killer, but one thing we can be certain of is that a man capable of murdering and violating a nun in her mid-70s is nothing shy of a complete monster. In late October of 1982, 69-year-old Marvin Brandlin was living with his wife Ethel in the leafy green suburbs of Fort Dodge, Iowa. Their neighborhood they called home was a quiet, tranquil place, but every Halloween, the streets came alive with legions of trick-or-treaters. Marvin and Ethel delighted at the display of colorful and creative costumes, and happily handed out candy to any children who darkened their door. In 1982, Halloween fell on a Sunday, so in order to avoid any sugar-induced hyperactivity on what amounted to be a school night, the vast majority of trick-or-treating took place on Saturday the 30th. By around 9 p.m., a steady stream of visitors had started to peter out. The Brandlins believed the rest of their evening would be relatively undisturbed. At around 10 p.m., they received one last knock at their door. Marvin shuffled towards the door half expecting to see one last group of trick-or-treaters outside. But when he opened up the door, he immediately knew something was horribly wrong. Standing on their doorstep, a man who appeared to be wearing a pillowcase on his head. Gazing out of two roughly cut holes were eyes that regarded him with a cold, calculating hatred. And when he saw the gun in the masked man's hand, Marvin realized that this was no trick-or-treater. The masked man raised his pistol pointed it squarely at Marvin's head, then told him to back up away from the door. Marvin simply raised his hands and did as the man asked. Assuming he was some kind of armed robber, Marvin told the masked man that he was welcome to take anything he wanted. There was very little of anything of value in the home. According to Ethel, 
This was when the masked man told her husband something to the effect of, I know about the safe, Marvin. To Marvin's knowledge, only he and his wife knew about the safe he kept hidden in his own office. And realizing that the masked man knew of its existence must have been nothing short of horrifying. You see, Marvin had very little confidence in the centralized banking system and chose to keep the majority of his life savings much closer to hand. This meant that his safe contained upwards of $40,000 with a further $5,000 worth of gold bullion. And naturally, the Brandlins tried their utmost to keep the safe a closely guarded secret. But there was no time to wonder how the man in the mask had come to learn of the Brandlin safe. Because if he managed to empty it, the financial repercussions would be nothing short of catastrophic. With that in mind, Marvin suddenly lunged for the masked man's pistol, making one desperate attempt to save his fortune. But the man was fast, and too fast for Marvin, and in a split second, he sent a bullet ripping through Marvin's neck. Realizing that the robbery had gone horribly wrong, the masked man quickly fled the Brandlin's home, pulling off his mask during the escape route before tossing it over a garden fence. A devastated Ethel Brandlin quickly called 911, but despite Marvin being rushed to a hospital in Des Moines, he passed away during emergency surgery in the early hours of October 31st. With Ethel unable to give police an adequate physical description of the suspect, homicide detectives had no idea who the killer might be. The only real clue they had pertained to the killer's knowledge of the Brandlet safe, meaning there was an extremely high probability that the suspect was either a member of their extended social circle or even one of Brandlin's younger relatives. The couple's granddaughter, Teresa Trueblood, remembers hearing the news of Marvin's murder. You go numb, she told a local media outlet. I had to take my grandmother back to the house to get medicine. You walk in and you're just in disbelief that it's happening so you see the blood and you know it's real. As months passed, the police failed to identify a subject and Ethel became increasingly depressed and despondent. Her heartbreak peaked during Thanksgiving dinner. After suffering what amounted to be a nervous breakdown, she died a few months later. She just quit eating and broke down and she cried and cried and cried, Ethel's daughter recalled. And you know, I'll never forget when they carried her out in a chair. They always said she died of a broken heart because she didn't want to be by herself. As of 2010, the case was reopened in hopes of gleaning DNA evidence from the discarded pillowcase mask. But sadly, forensic analysis were unable to do so. Yet perhaps the most terrifying thing about this case is that the Brandlin family and their extended relatives seem to know exactly who the killer is. The only thing keeping them from the justice they deserve is the fact that there simply isn't enough corroborating evidence. For the longest time, we didn't pursue anything because we knew in our stomach, in our gut, who it was, said Teresa Trueblood. But there was fear. Grandma always lived in fear. To this day, not a single suspect has been officially named in relation to Marvin Brandlin's murder. This killer continues to hide in plain sight. So this Halloween, take caution who you open your doors to, because hiding among the throngs of innocent trick-or-treaters could be some very dangerous people. Halloween is my favorite holiday, not was despite the events that unfolded one crisp Hollow's Eve when I was 16. At the time I lived with my parents, younger brother, older stepbrother, and cousin in a big but old house that sat in a cul-de-sac close to Main Street. Behind it ran an alleyway flanked by apartments, and it had a huge yard that my basement bedroom looked out on. We live in a small town, crime seemed minimal in the area, and I made my way out that Halloween night to make the most of the best day of the year. It wasn't just what happened that night though, it was of course what came after, and one small incident that came before. A few days before Halloween, my stepbrother and cousin arrived home to discover a pickup truck full of dudes taking pictures of our house. Weird, 
but when we approached the men, they seemed friendly and complimented our Halloween setup. It was pretty great, that is true. The men sped off without incident and were quickly forgotten. My stepbrother and cousin re-entered the story Halloween night, the big event itself. At about 3 a.m., both had been out drinking with their friends, and as such, both had left their respective vehicles and braved the icy walk home on their own. My cousin arrived home first, but couldn't seem to get his key into the lock, so just sat on the porch bench and waited for my stepbrother to show up. He did around a half an hour later. After having a bit of a laugh at my cousin for being so uncoordinated, he went to unlock the door himself. And no luck. They bit the bullet and called my mom, waking her up to let them in. She was, of course, unimpressed to be opening up the door for a pair of drunk idiots at this time of night and didn't buy their story about the wonky lock. They insisted, though, and to shut them up, she finally relented and tried her key. She, too, could not get her key in the lock. Annoyed, tired, and just now confused, she wrote it off as a problem for tomorrow, and the three of them hit their respective hay. One other person arrived home late that night. Me. Though I arrived much earlier than those two and was in bed by about midnight, I woke up close to 1 a.m., still tired. All I could feel was anxiety and I didn't know why. At first, I tried to tell myself that I'd just gotten in a bit too much into the holiday spirit and psyched myself out. But then, I noticed a shadow. It was perfectly man-shaped and cast upon my window. I turned on my bedside lamp, blinked, and it was gone. It wasn't unusual, mind you, to see the shadows of people harmlessly walking through the alley, and I told myself that's all there was to it, but there was what happened after. I came home from school the next day. My parents were there, so was the locksmith, and so were the police. My parents were there because, well, that's where they lived. The locksmith was there because my mother had called him, as the confusion over the broken lock persisted. The cops were there because the locksmith and my parents had called them and the locksmith proceeded to pull the tip of a knife out of our lock. I was relieved to see that that's where the knife tip had ended up, though, as they discovered two of our window screens had also been slashed, one on our garage and one at my bedroom window. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All these links are below. Hey, what's up everybody? Um, long time no see, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, most of you who are regulars here are not going to be surprised by what I'm about to tell you, but I had every intention of doing and putting out tons of content for this Halloween season, but it's just not going to happen, man. Um, these were supposed to be three separate episodes, but I've all morphed it into one because it's been over a week now since I've uploaded. I intended on uploading at least three times last week. Didn't happen. Intended on uploading three times the week previous didn't happen. It's extremely hard if you want to peek behind the curtain just a little bit into my life. It's extremely hard to find quiet hours of the day and night in my house with a four-year-old and a three-month-old baby. So I was a little, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I wanted to do more and it's just not going to happen. Uh, I, it sucks. I wish I, that wasn't the outcome, but it is what it is. And that's my life right now. I, I can't help it. I just by the time the house is quiet, it's like late at night and I just don't have the energy for it. And I'm more proactive during the day. And during the day, I have my three-month-old baby. So, yeah, I see where my uh, my problems are and where they lie. So, hopefully this makes up for it by having a nice longer episode that I normally put out. Um, there, I've had some really awesome people, um, two of which help me find stories and are helping me find stories. And they do a fantastic job. I'm just super picky, man, and a lot of these Halloween stories are just the same thing over and over, over and over and over and over and over, and it just sucks. I wish there was like 
there's is really good stories out there, but they're just hard to come by. And as much as I truly appreciate those have helped me um, find stories and Sherry and um, Spooky Man and I, you both are fantastic. Thank you so much for helping me out and finding these stories. Um, truly, truly means the world to me. And it truly meant a lot to me, a lot to me for you helping me because it did get a lot of these stories in here. But I couldn't fit them all in here. And there's a lot of them that were fine and good, but they're just, I don't know. I have this specific eye that I'm looking for these stories and a lot of them are just duplicates. And even there's a couple of them in here that I read that I'm just like, meh, I mean, it's, it's something. And I wanted to get something out for you guys. So hopefully, I don't know. I think it, the, also the problem is, is I look at Joel's stories and he has these fantastic stories that are just like scary, allegedly true. You know, there it's, it's all, it, everything's there. It checks off all the things that I want. And I just, I have this, I don't know what you call it, but this bar I have set in my head for stories. And I realize I can't bat a thousand on every episode. I'm not going to be able to find these fantastic stories. I feel like I only find them once in a while, but again, I appreciate you ladies helping me out regardless. Um, and I know, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just rambling at this point. So I haven't done a ramble in a while. But I appreciate you all. Um, the I know there's some of you that aren't really big fans of the collabs. And I think I'm really legitimately probably only going to start collabing on my channel um, once a year. And that's for the Halloween collaboration where I'll have other narrators and stuff come on. Um, outside of that, I don't think I'm going to collab very much anymore because it's it's obvious that not a lot of you, most of you don't like them. And it's understandable why. You're here to listen to me. And that's not to you know pump up my ego or anything like that. But you go to Let's Read to listen to Let's Read. You go to Derek Weber's Scary Stories to listen to Derek Weber. You come here to listen to me. You go to Darkest Hour to listen to Darkest Hour. So you're not there to listen to other people. So I'm going to limit the amount of times I do that because I don't want to piss anybody off. Um, yeah, uh, I think I think I've rambled long enough. And it looks like my daughter is probably waking up too. So I'm going to end this here. Um, that collab will be out on Sunday for sure, for sure. Promise, pinky promise. I already have that already almost done, and that's uh, too easy. So, hopefully, you enjoyed this episode. Hopefully, you en enjoyed my rambling. And um, if I don't talk to you before then, which I guess I will, you hope you guys are having a fantastic Halloween season and a spooky season, whatever you want to call it. Watching some good movies, eating some candy, doing all that thing stuff. Blah 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 blah. All right, I love you all very much. I truly do. Thank you for uh, for being here and supporting me. Whether you like my channel, whether you like the content or not, I appreciate it. Um, thank you again. Cheers. <laughs>